Therefore, Patiratha, devoted to the husband, Naryaha, women, Shayakamaha, a conscientious. Uh, that means one who pays attention and does things properly. Sumajame, O thin waisted woman. A yajante, worship. Ananya bhavena, with devotion. Actually, it technically means ananya bhavena, it means single minded devotion. <laughs> Patim, the husband, the husband. Atmanam, Atmanam, the super soul, the super soul. Ishvanam, Ishvanam. <coughs> representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, translation, my dear wife, whose body is so beautiful, your waist being thin, a conscientious <coughs> wife should be chaste and should abide by the orders of her husband. She, she, she should very devotedly, <coughs> devoutly, sorry, <coughs> devoutly worship her husband as a representative of Vasudeva. <coughs> Sounds like he's a little <coughs> enamored here. All right, so there's no purport to this text nor is there purport to the next text so we'll just read the next text and the third text as a purport so hum twaya chito bhadre itri bhavena bhaktitaka tam te sampadehe kamam asati nam sudulabham my dear gentle wife, because you have worshipped me with great devotion, considering me a representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I shall reward you by fulfilling your desires, which are un unobtainable for an unchaste wife. And so finally, text 37. <laughs> Putram Indrahanam Vene Amritum Ritta Putraham Yena Mega Titao Sutao. Did he reply, O oh my husband, O oh great soul, I have now lost my sons. If you want to give me a benediction, I ask you for an immortal son who can kill Indra. I pray for this because Indra with the help of Vishnu, has killed my two sons, Ranyaksha and Ranyakashipu. So, for Port by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, Ki, Chai. The word Indra on all means one who can kill Indra, but it also means one who follows Indra. The word Amrityum refers to the demigods who do not die like ordinary human beings because they have extremely long durations of life. For example, the duration of Lord Brahma's life is stated in Bhagavad Gita. Sahasra Yuga Pariyanta Mahara Yad Ramano Viduhu. Even the duration of one day or twelve hours of Brahma is 4,300,000 years multiplied by 1,000. Thus, the duration of his life is inconceivable for an ordinary human being. The demigods are therefore sometimes called Amara, which means one who has no death. In this material world, however, everyone has to die. Therefore, the word Amritjum indicates that Diti wanted a son who would be equal in status to the demigods. All right. So. Om Magana Timaranda Shah, Gananjana Shalakaya, Chakshur Hun Militam, Yena Tasmai Shigarveda Maha. So you, here you see something that is pretty standard 
in the Vedic literatures, in the Bhagavatam especially, when someone asks for a benediction that they want to cause harm to others, the benediction that is, let's say, helpful for them in their quest to uh, cause harm to others. And what happens when people ask for these benedictions, whether they be diti or demons or whatever, uh, these benedictions actually come out a little bit different for the person who is asking for the benedictions. And they come out in such a way uh, that it's helpful for the Krishna consciousness of the person and helpful for the universe. Uh, so Krishna has this trick. It's uh, actually a linguistic trick. And uh, another example of this, I'm going to give some examples in class, is the uh, story of Kumbhakarna. Kumbhakarna, of course, is the brother of Ravan and Indrajit and Supranaka. So the story goes as follows. These four personalities, Ravan, Kumbhakarna, Indrajit, and beautiful Serpanaka were performing austerities. This is from the Ramayana, in case you all don't know what the Ramayana is. Ramayana is the story of Lord Ram, it's an Itihasa history. So they were performing austerities in order to get different benedictions from the demigods, particularly they were approaching Lord Brahma. As Krishna says in the Gita, what does that mean? That those who are bereft of intelligence or full of lust, uh, both things, kamalis, daistar, ritigyana, prapajante, yadevata. In other words, those who are full of lust are devoid of intelligence, ritigyana, prapajante. They surrender to the demigods. Uh, and the interesting thing is, before we continue with the story, is that sometimes devotees approach the demigods, but for Krishna conscious purposes. So this verse in the Gita doesn't apply to the devotees. For example, the gopis, they approach the goddess Kachiyane to get Krishna as a husband, right? And they were doing this thing called the Kachiyane Brat. That means for a whole month, they were bathing in the Yamuna River, and it was very cold, and eating this thing called uh, Havisha, which means like unspiced kitri, unspiced, unsalted kitri, no ghee or anything like that. And uh, to get Krishna as their husband. And at the end of the month, guess what happened? Krishna. The last time they were bathing, after the uh, Katsuyami brought, Krishna stole their clothes. And then they were forced to come out of the river naked, and that indicated that Krishna was their husband at that particular point. So that sometimes devotees worship the demigods for spiritual purposes. And in the case of the four personalities we just mentioned, Ravana, Kumbhakarna, uh, Bibishan and Serpanaka. Uh, Bibishan had a spiritual purpose, but let's get on with the story. So, uh, Ravana, he was worshipping hmm, Lord Brahma, and he got a little frustrated in his worship because Lord Brahma didn't appear. And so, therefore, what did he do? He started to cut off his heads and offer them into the fire. He's actually known as... Uh, Dasa Griva, that means ten-headed one. This is like the Lord has an uh, incarnation with a horse head. He's called Hoya Griva. You understand? Hoya Griva, the horse head of the incarnation of Krishna. So Dasa Griva is Ravana. So anyway, so he's offering his heads, swaha, you know, head swaha, whatever, into the fire. And then eventually Lord Brahma appears and Lord Brahma says, oh, my dear devotee, what do you want? And he says, uh, I simply want to become 
Same thing demons always ask for, immortal. And little monsters can't do, but you can choose, basically, uh, how you want to die. In other words, do it in a negative way, how you don't want to die. And, and we all know the story that he says, I don't want to be killed by any demigods, powerful people like that, but he avoids mentioning human beings or monkeys or animals. Because he thinks he's so powerful that no human being can touch him. So, of course, later on, that's uh, the reason Lord Ram appears as a human being, so he can kill Ram. So then let's get on to the next one, Kumbhakarna, which is the one I really wanted to talk about. Kumbhakarna, he was uh, quite enormous. That means quite big. And he ate quite a bit. When it was time for Prashadam, he ate everything. There wasn't anything left over for the other devotees to eat. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Anyway. And actually both uh, Ravana and Kumbhakarna were incarnations of giant Vijay just like Aranyakashipu and Aranyaksha. So, so, anyway, so he was eating a lot, and the demigods were very worried, you know, what is going to happen? You know, there's not going to be any food left over for us, or for the human beings, or for anybody else. So, Kumakarna, he asked for the benediction of having the throne of Indra. And the way uh, it's expressed is, Indra Asana. So, just like here, you know, you can understand Sanskrit in two different ways. Uh, it was understood Indra, you know, he just, he had a little pr uh, problem with his pronunciation. He said Indra na, uh, Nidra Asana. You know, in Nidra or Indra? Indra means the greatest. The word means the greatest and refers generally to Indra. It's actually a name of Krishna, too. Uh, it's interesting. It's also the name of Krishna, in spite of being the name of the demigod Indra. So he asked for Nidra Asana. Nidra means something different than Indra. Nidra means sleep. So he asked for a bed, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so <coughs> Lord Brahma interpreted it that, uh, yes, you should be able to sleep, practically speaking, forever. <laughs> only every six months you can get up this is also to help the demigods and everybody else so there'd be enough food in the creation so this is quite a benediction and uh, Kumbhakarni said I didn't really mean that and he started to fall asleep at that point and his brother hmm, Ravana he went to Lord Brahma and said my dear Lord he is one of your creation. How can you do this to him to let him sleep all the time and just wake up every six months to eat? <laughs> Some people was like that. Just sleep all the time. Anyway, constant coma. So what happened is that Lord Brahma felt a little compassion and Lord Brahma said, okay. Actually, he wasn't supposed to get up every six months. I'm sorry, I missed the story. He was supposed to sleep forever. And then by the prayers of Ravana, he was allowed to wake up every six months. <coughs> so I got the story a little reversed there. Okay. And so, uh, Lord Brahma said, but when he is woken up <coughs> prematurely before his six months is up, that's going to be when he dies. Okay. Benediction. So you see, all these different benedictions are meant for a particular purpose. The Lord has, has everything arranged, as he says in the Gita. That I am giving people intelligence, remembrance, and forgetfulness. According, of course, one says according to their desire, but actually according to his plan. It was interesting. So then, of course, you have Bibishan, <coughs> the third brother, who we mentioned before. And Vibhishan asked for devotion to the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Lord Brahma said to him, therefore I bless you with immortality. Now that's interesting. So how could he bless Vibhishan with immortality? Well, a devotee 
is immortal. Maybe not in the same body. Well, not in the same body. Not maybe not in the same body. But a devotee is immortal because whatever he is doing now, he will do eternally. Right? You don't have to give it up. You're going on Sankirtan now. It's like you just had a uh, Christmas marathon. So eternally you're going to have Christmas. Well, maybe not Christmas. <laughs> maybe we'll be uh, Kwanzaa or something like that in the next life. Or some other type. Anyway, eternally you're going to be preaching Krishna consciousness and helping bring people to Krishna. So he got that benediction. So just like the sage, when he blessed a devotee, he said to a devotee, you can either live or you can die. When he blessed a meat eater or a butcher, he said, uh, you should not die and you should not live. <laughs> when he blessed the king, he said, long live the king, you should live a long life. When he blessed the brahmachari, he said, die immediately. Why do you say that? Because if someone is not a devotee and a brahmachari, you know, we're not talking about Krishna conscious brahmacharis. If someone is not a devotee and a brahmachari, it's better he dies because at least he'll go to the sun planet. Because, you know, he's uh, performing great austerity. So, anyway, so uh, you see these benedictions actually are actually part of the Lord's plan. Okay, let's get to Surpanaka. Hmm. The word Surpanaka means uh, the lady with long nails. Not only long nails, but curved nails like this, like claws. <laughs> That's why she was called Surpanaka. So she, was, she asked for the benediction of being able to change her form at will. In other words, to look beautiful, because, you know, she was quite uh, hideous looking. Hideous means ugly. She looked very ugly. And she actually had a, it's described in the film, we can remind, she had a beer belly. I don't know if you know beer belly. <laughs> You've seen someone who drinks a lot of beer? <laughs> like, it looks like the man looks like he's pregnant. So uh, she had a belly like that. So anyways, <laughs> so, she was given that benediction, and that benediction was very useful. Because later on, when she saw Ram and Lakshman in the forest, in the Dandakaranya forest, she uh, became attracted to Ram, and she changed her form into that of a beautiful young girl. Uh, and Ram and Lakshman sort of joked with her, and she tried to attack Sita Devi eventually, and uh, her nose and ears and other things were cut off. So anyway, so it was all part of the Lord's plan. That's what I'm, the point I'm making. It's all part of the Lord's plan. And you see this in every case where there's a benediction given. Even sometimes devotees, they ask for a benediction and the Lord gives them a benediction in such a way that makes them more renounced from this material world. Just like in the case of... Uh, Mark and Dea Rishi, the stories in the Bhagavatam. Mark and Dea Rishi had some curiosity. He was a great devotee. And he was praying to the Lord. The Lord ultimately appeared before him. And Krishna asked, what do you want, my dear devotee? Now, normally a devotee would say, you know, Brahma Janmani, Janmani Shure, Bhavata Bhakti, Ahoitukhi Tvaye. I simply want your causeless devotional service life after life. But what did he ask for? He said, I want to see Maya. And so he thought, you know, just get a little demonstration, a few photographs. <laughs> you know, people have this idea, you know, you want to see Maya. So Krishna said, okay. And immediately noticed that there was the waters of devastation coming. That means the end of the cosmic, or at least part of the cosmic creation. And they were engulfing him, and he was swimming, but not swimming, enjoying himself. It's like I was talking to the devotees yesterday about the summer camps we used to have where the devotees would themselves. 
but he was swimming and there were these gigantic waves and these timagilla fish. Jai, she's going to die, Panchatabuki Jai. There were gigantic waves and the timangilla fish that were threatening to eat him and he was just like threatened at every moment, scared to death. And he was thinking, when is this going to end? And it lasted for a long time. And then all of a sudden, he sees an island. And on the island, there's a big banyan tree with a big leaf on the banyan tree. And on that big leaf is a little baby. And the baby is sucking his toe. <laughs> that baby, of course, is Krishna. And the reason, actually, the baby was sucking his toe is because Krishna likes the taste of his lotus feet also. <laughs> That's described by the Acharyas. Can you imagine? Not an ordinary baby. So he, he went up to the baby because the baby was extremely attractive. And the baby breathed in, and he was sucked into the baby's body. <laughs> and then when he was sucked into the baby's body, he saw the creation the way it was. He saw his ashram, his hermitage. He was back in his hermitage. And then the baby breathed out, <laughs> and he came out again. Anyway, more Maya. So, in this way, the benediction he asked for was not exactly what he wanted. So you got to be careful what you ask for Krishna, isn't it? What you ask Krishna for. But it always works out for the best of the person's Krishna consciousness and the Lord's pastimes. Another story that illustrates this is the story of uh, Vrkasura. That's a story from the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. In Vrkasura, he was worshipping Lord Shiva in a very interesting way. He was peeling flesh from his body and offering it to the fire. And Lord Shiva did not appear. And he got very frustrated. <coughs> and so he thought, I'll just go offer my head. So he's, you know, that's the ultimate sacrifice. So he was getting ready to throw his head in the fire. And Lord Shiva came to him and said, I am Ashatosh. Ashatosh means very easily pleased, very easily angered. So I'm pleased. You didn't have to do this. So Lord Shiva says, what do you want, my dear devotee? And this Vrikasura says, Vrikasura. Not Vrikasura, it's Vrikasura. Vrikasura says, I want the benediction of anyone uh, head who I touch will split into like a million pieces. Or a thousand. I mean, I guess like even two pieces is enough. <laughs> you know, you don't have to ask for 10 million pieces, but whatever. So, uh, Lord Shiva says, you know, the toss you know, you have that benediction. And immediately this rascal, he thought, now I should enjoy with Parvati. A Durga. Now you may think that that's pretty puffed up to want to enjoy with Durga, but I guess I have information for you that every one of us wants to enjoy with Durga. <laughs> We're all like that. He's a good example for us. What do I mean by that? Because Durga means the material energy. We all want to enjoy the material energy. But we are actually Prakriti too, not Purusha. So, what happens is that he wants to directly enjoy with Durga, and he goes chasing after Lord Shiva to sort of annihilate Lord Shiva, touch Lord Shiva's head. And he's running all over the place, and Lord Shiva's running all over the place. Lord Shiva eventually goes to uh, Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu says to him, why do you give these benedictions to these demons? <laughs> You know, don't you understand? You know, this, you know, can't you stop it? But Lord Shiva's Ashatosh, she generally does that. So, uh, Lord Vishnu says, okay, I'll take care of it this time. So Lord Vishnu changes himself into a Shiva walker. And Shiva Bhakti means you have Rudraksha beads around your neck. And this demon comes to him, and Lord Vishnu says in the form of the Shiva Bhakti, 
what are you doing? Why are you running so hard? And uh, Rikar Sura said, I'm running after Lord Shiva to touch his head. I got this benediction and I want Parvati. And Lord Vishnu says that don't you understand? Lord Shiva's benedictions don't work. He cheats a lot. So before wasting your human form of life or whatever demon form of life, you know, because you're exercising too much. <laughs> it's like it's described in the Vedic literature is that the amount of uh, breaths that you have is limited. So like probably would comment sometimes when you see people exercising, they're coming closer to death, you know, because when you're exercising, <laughs> you know, 10 million, nine, you know, whatever, 9 million, 999,999 breaths left, you know, 998, 997. <laughs> of course, for devotees, don't worry. That doesn't mean I'm saying don't exercise. For devotees, you know, you don't have to worry about the number of breaths left. Just keep, keep breathing hard and chant. You know, otherwise, if devotees take this literally, they'll stop having ecstatic kirtans. They'll just have slow kirtans. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada said, actually, that's how yogis live a long time. They actually control their breathing like that. Prabhupada said, one of the best yogis is a frog. <laughs> Did you know that? The Prabhupada said, they go, during the winter, do you know what they do? They go in the mud, and they they stop their breathing, and then they hibernate. It's more than hibernating. Like a bear, a bear hibernates, but a bear still breathes. But the uh, frog, because he's air breathing, can't breathe underwater, and he goes into suspended animation, and he lives a long time. Actually, there's stories about how archaeologists they would break into stone that was like thousands of years old and all of a sudden a frog would jump out. <laughs> it's true, I mean, it's a true story. Because frogs are the best yogis, so you want to be a yogi, you know. <laughs> be a frog in your next life. So anyway, so, getting back to the story. So, uh, Lord Vishnu said <laughs> to Rikasura that, uh, you're breathing too hard, you know, you just may hurt yourself, you know. So you should test the benediction first. And Rikasura, Rikasura, said, that's a good idea. How should I test the benediction? And Lord Vishnu said, well, I mean, it's easy. Just touch your own head, you know, and see if it works. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you can hold Lord Shiva responsible. And if it does work, then you can go after Lord Shiva again. You know, demons are not so intelligent. So, so he, what he does is he says, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> he touches his head and boom, it explodes more or less. And then that's the end of the demon. So, so there's another example. Actually, there's so many examples how benedictions actually work that are given by the demigods or given by the Supreme Lord. They actually work in as part of the Lord's pastimes or part of the demon's demise. Final story I'll tell. It's from the Mahabharata. It's the story of Sunda and Upasunda. These were two demons who were so powerful. And they also approached Lord Brahma for a benediction. And they wanted immortality. And Lord Brahma said, no, but you can choose the way you die. So they said, well, we want to die. The only way we would die is if we killed each other. They were brothers. They loved each other. And they thought, this is not going to happen. You know, why will two brothers kill each other? So, Lord Brahma said to Tassa, yeah, he can have that benediction. So, they went back and started terrorizing the universe again, tearing everything up. And uh, Bumi again went to the demigods, what should we do? And the demigods thought for a while, and they had information from their Lord Vishnu in their hearts how to kill these demons. The method was, very interesting method, 
Lord Brahma called for Vishvakarma. And he said to Vishvakarma, you should create the most beautiful lady ever. And so Vishvakarma took, I guess not only is he good at architecture and buildings, but also building people. <laughs> so he took all the different beautiful parts, you know, beautiful nose, beautiful eyes, beautiful ears, beautiful hair, beautiful whatever. And he put them all together, you know, like, I guess like a Lego set. You know what a Lego set is? <laughs> anyway, put them all together and came up with this girl, her name was Tilotama. That may have been uh, topmost sesame seed. Like in India, at least many years ago, a girl was called beautiful, she was called uh, Little Sesame Seed, or something like that. I don't know why they use that expression. My Little Sesame Seed. <laughs> it's kind of romantic. So, uh, she was called Tilotama, and before she embarked on her mission for the demigods, she circumambulated the demigods. And she was so beautiful that some of them grew extra heads or eyes so they could see her. And they sent her on the mission. And she went to where Sunda and Upasunda were. And they were completely drunk. And when they saw her, one of them said, she's mine. And the other one said, no, she's mine. And they began to fight with each other. And you know what happened. They killed each other. <laughs> So these are all different pastimes. You'll find the Vedic literatures are full of these pastimes of when people pray to the demigods for something material and they get it and it causes their demise. Or, you know, ultimately it's for the best for them and the best for the universe, as we mentioned before. So here in this particular case, we have Ditti uh, praying to have a... Uh, child, immortal, demigod child, who can uh, kill Indra. But actually, these words also meant uh, someone who is, uh, let's say, a follower or associate of Indra. And later on, uh, later on she does get, uh, as we'll read in this Bhagavatam uh, portion, she does get the Maruts, who were actually associates of Indra. Which is very interesting. So, this, and in addition, she becomes Krishna conscious because the sacrifice that she's being told to perform uh, actually is a Krishna conscious sacrifice or Krishna conscious austerity. And by doing that, she becomes Krishna conscious. So, even though she didn't know that that was the intention. So, that's another very interesting point that even if someone has some other desire and worships Krishna, as we mentioned yesterday in the last few days, akama, moksha, kama, dharadi, tivrena bhakti yogeni yajeta purusham param, one still will attain Krishna consciousness eventually, even if one approaches Krishna for something mundane. Like Dhruva Maharaj was the example we gave, but there's so many other examples like that. And all of us, when we come to Krishna consciousness, we are approaching Krishna for something not spiritual. Chatur Vita Bhajanti Mam, we're approaching Krishna because we want wealth, we're approaching Krishna because we're in distress, we're approaching Krishna because we want knowledge or just because we want to figure out what those Hare Krishnas are doing, inquisitive. And then ultimately, we become Krishna conscious. So anyway, so these the points, so any questions or comments? Uh, right. okay. to Barbara. Uh, Dharma, Barbara, you know, whatever. Dharma. Mm -hmm. okay. Actually, be ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, I went to the high school for design here in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. Yeah. And I was in the same class as uh, Ines Knaus was, so we were classmates. Yeah. And uh, Ines uh, is actually a sister of Melania, so Melania Trump. Oh, how fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> and 
then uh, the question is, you know, so it's going actually for a very interesting combination, you say, you have the US and Slovenia, I mean, from, from the perspective of a couple who is living in the United States. No, unfortunately. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Uh, the combination of Melania and her blessed husband. <laughs> How do I see that combination? Yeah. It's called karma. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's a plan by Krishna. Well, ultimately Krishna is in charge of everything, but in this particular case, I firmly believe it's karma. It's karma, and it can be understood by astrology. You know, uh, but the stars. That's romantic. Anyway, <laughs> the accents of the stars. But for devotee, devotee, if someone is actually devotee, chanting and everything like that, um, then it's Krishna's will. So th there's many things happening in the karmic way. I was just reading a horoscope. Actually, someone sent me a horoscope this morning of the, of the world. And they said, 2020, get ready, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> and, you know, so it may be true. But for a devotee, it's up to Krishna. So I don't think millennia, millennia, sorry, is chanting the holy name. Maybe. Maybe she is inadvertently, if, if they ever stay at the Ramada Inn, that's a hotel chain. <laughs> But I think they will always stay at another hotel chain, which I shall not mention in Bhagavatam class, <laughs> which is not related to the holy name. So, but actually, uh, previously the president of a particular country, which should remain nameless, helped the devotees do Rathiatra. So there's some connection with Krishna. Do you know that? The devotees needed a place to construct the Rathiatra carts. So he arranged for a place on as many properties. So there's some connection. I mean, Krishna consciousness is so all-pervading in this world, you can't really escape the Hare Krishnas anymore. <laughs> Especially here in Slovenia, where there's more books that were distributed per capita than any country in the world. I mean, it's just, it seems the people here think we're everywhere, right? You know, it's like, like that's general was the case generally where a lot of devotees were going out in Harinam and Sankirtan every day that uh, people thought we had millions of people, devotees. And so here in Slovenia it's like that. So yeah, so obviously there's some connection there. I mean actually one of the devotees told me well, the brother of one of the devotees was a I don't want to say this was a boyfriend of Melania before. <laughs> so it's a small country, everyone's connected somehow or other. I just, I think just, I know Ines, so her sister. Yeah. And uh, you know uh, his father, I mean her father. You know her father? Yeah, he knows. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, we got some preaching programs today. <laughs> yeah. I just, I mean, it's kind of really strange because Ines was really a great person. Mm. She was really very nice, and um, I mean, to me, it looks very strange. I think <laughs> so. That's I, I just asked because it's kind of so many, I'd say, strange coincidences how she she gets through. I mean, not Ines, but also Melania through life. And on the other hand, so it really goes with also today classes. There is so many coincidences. Yeah, yes. there's something. Ultimately, Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna, is arranging something. Yes. And I don't really know what that means right now. I'm not one of these uh, psychics who can tell you. It could be a war that Krishna's arranging that'll make it. No, I hope not. I hope not too. But we don't, we don't know. You know, there's somehow or other, God is behind the scenes. It's, it's supposed to be the uh, 
golden age of Kali Yuga. How is that going to happen? How are people going to become pious? Things are happening. I mean, for example, like there's more people who are vegetarians, vegans right now. Yeah, there are societal changes happening. Exactly how, what or how Krishna does it, I am not his advisor, Krishna's advisor. So things will happen. Yeah. Actually, Slovenia is a very interesting country, but basically, you can always find someone who knows someone else in Slovenia. Isn't it? Because it's small. It's a small country. Something like Fiji. Fiji's the same thing. And uh, Slovenia is a very fortunate country. Uh, you had one previous uh, president, Zinorshik, who was basically almost Christ completely Krishna conscious. I visited him actually. Spent time. I spent an hour with him. And we were talking about Krishna consciousness and the world and the situation. And uh, he was quite, quite an interesting person and quite just like, just about Krishna conscious, you know, almost Krishna conscious. And he was taking prasadam regularly because it, uh, Magendra knew his secretary. You know the story? I think some of you know the story. Magendra knew his secretary and the secretary was learning how to cook for Magendra and they were giving, the, the, uh, giving him uh, prasadam on a regular basis. There's great potential in this country because so many books have been distributed and, you know, the people are very much open. And we have restaurants here, you know, two restaurants, you know, at least two restaurants. Right? You know, there are other vegan restaurants besides our two restaurants. So, so you're from a very fortunate country. I'm not. <laughs> Now, now I have to be embarrassed of telling people where I'm from. <laughs> Stay away from me. Anyway, but Lomani is a very nice country. So, any qu any other questions? Yes, no. <coughs> Guru David, last few days you a lot talk about, uh, like you say, controversial topic. I was hoping not to be controversial today. <laughs> what? Uh, I was quite like a heavy pain in the arm. And, uh, I was quite last days, but I must be honest that you, are, as you say yesterday, we should not blindly accept everything. And, uh, yeah. It's obvious and so, so I must be honest, I something cannot really understand fully. And also cannot accept some because something because of my different experience which I had. If you can allow me to discuss a little more about this okay. topic. So first of all, I want to say I'm not a chauvinistic in the, my attitude. <laughs> uh, as you know, I love my wife the most in the life. And she's my best friend. <laughs> And I have only one desire and one, one wish, one desire in my life to, together with my wife, eternally serve Krishna after this lifetime and to go back home to, to, together with my wife and eternally that we can eternally serve Krishna. So I'm listening to Shiva Prabhupada non stop for the years, every right. day. And about this topic between male and female, Shiva Prabhupada very, really, very clearly said in the direct way quite uh, strong statements. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for example, when he was often asked from some journalists and so on in America, at that time it was very prominent, this uh, uh, equal rights between men and women. And we can hear from Shiva Prabhupada very clearly that he was not appreciate mm. this idea, idea. Uh, he very strongly criticized this. Mm -hmm. And he explained that this means that women will be even more exploited in the future and misused. Yes. And not be protected. 
And we can see that this is really become true. Today's society, not so many divorces as going on, divorces between wife and husbands. Mm -hmm. Also, we can see, uh, unfortunately, in our society, from Kadamba Kana Maharaj, recently he was here, we can heard from him that this is the one of the most problems now in his divorces mm. between husband and wives. So, Srila Prabhupada also said in many occasions that when he was asked what woman should do in the Hare Krishna movement, in Krishna consciousness, he said she should, also, she should only follow her husband and that's all. I recently listened just to this conversation. He was very good. She should, she should just follow her husband and that's all. Also, he did this, uh, this, this, the statements in Bhagavatam, many, many mm -hmm. places and stuff. And to end this little interaction before I ask you something, about this female Krishna Guru, also I can not fully understand this, mm -hmm. because in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhagavatam clearly, clearly said, in one part of that Suniti, who was mother of Dhruva Maharaj, mm -hmm. she cannot become Diksha Guru of Dhruva Maharaj because she is a woman and also she is his mother. Now my question is, why so much interpretation of these very clearly statements of Srila Prabhupada. If mm -hmm. you read carefully and uh, listen carefully, he was very strong and very, uh, and, and I can see from my experience. Can you, can you stop for a second? Because there's several different points. No, you're... I, my question is. Well, wait, wait a second. There's several different points you're making, and you're clearly agitated. So, that, you know, to think clearly, you should, you should be peaceful about these things. There's something else going on. So, as far as the woman Diksha Guru, there's a statement by Prabhupada, I want all my devotees, I don't remember the exact word, uh, but, you know, the boys and girls who take this test, they can become gurus. There's a very clear statement that Prabhupada, wait a second. No, no, Prabhupada said gurus. And then you can increase the generations. That means, first of all, I mean, if you want to get into a whole discussion, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami says, Siksha Guru and Diksha Guru are equal and different manifestations of Krishna. <coughs> in fact, in our Sampradaya, the Siksha Guru, see, you got so many different questions you threw out. <coughs> in our Sampradaya, uh, Siksha gurus are considered more important than Diksha gurus. So it's not that saying that women cannot be Diksha gurus but can be Siksha gurus says that they're less important. It says they're more important. So nowhere does Prabhupada say there cannot be women Diksha gurus. Secondly, I, and as far as that statement, or referring to Dhruva Maharaj's story, <clears throat> where he says that Suniti could not become the guru of Dhruva Maharaj because she was his mother as well as a woman. That is a descriptive statement. There's two things that we understand from Shastra. There's prescription and description. Description is given, and I hope everyone understands what I'm talking about, Description <clears throat> means describing a particular circumstance in a particular age. Prescription means you cannot do this. You understand? So one has to be able to understand Shastra from that particular point of view. That sometimes there's a description of something that happened or didn't happen or wasn't allowed in a particular time, place, and circumstance. And sometimes there's a prescription. A prescription is a definite statement, like a woman can never become a Diksha Guru. And if you look at our Sampradaya, there are women in our Sampradaya who are Diksha Gurus initiating, 
uh, initiating their own disciples. It's not at all unknown. And it's not just talking about John of Amata. John of Amata, of course, is a specific individual. But there's others who are less prominent or not interested in devotees who became uh, Diksha gurus on their own right. Now, as far as your first point about women being protected, obviously, I accept that 100%, and everything Prabhupada said, I accept 100%. I believe firmly that all the ladies should be protected, and that's part of the resolution that the GBC just passed about women becoming Diksha Gurus. It said that the woman must be protected either by her husband or her son or a senior Vaishnavi Sangha. In ISKCON, we have many ladies who for one reason or another are not married. And Prabhupada said he wanted to have a ladies ashram or ladies who were protected I mean, there's statements like that that Prabhupada made. He said, just like in the Catholic Church, they have that. And Prabhupada wanted that too. However, Prabhupada always wanted the ladies in a protected situation. Because, yes, independence in every aspect can be dangerous because the women can be exploited by men. You know, I'm 100%, everything Prabhupada said, I'm 100% behind it. But, uh, not but, 100% behind it. And there's ways to apply the same principle of protecting women. It's not only that, you know, obviously the best scenario would be that every woman is married to a perfect Krishna conscious husband or at least a semi-Krishna conscious husband. But that's not always going to be the case. And what do you do? What do you do with the ladies who are not married, or they were married before, or their husband died, or this or that? You can't, you can't just impose that particular situation. You have to understand the essence of Prabhupada's instruction is that women are protected. I agree 100%. When the women aren't protected, they're exploited. And then you see divorce and so many other things happening. Now, there's many reasons for divorce that are apart from the point of women not being protected. And uh, one of the, actually one of the primary reasons I see that people get divorced is their mother-in-laws interfere with the marriage. But that's another issue. That's another issue. I'm not in favor of divorce. I'm not in favor of remarriage. Prabhupada, actually, here's another point. Uh, several times there were men who left their wives and the women went, I was listening to Prabhupada memory about this the other day, and some of the women went to Prabhupada and they asked Prabhupada, can we get married? We have a young child. And Prabhupada said, no. So here's a woman who's not gonna be married, not gonna be protected by a husband, and Prabhupada said, no, just take shelter of Krishna as your husband. So, you know, there are different things. You, can't, you have to present a balanced approach to the Shastras. Different times, Prabhupada said different things in different circumstances. And that's, that's the way to understand Shastra. And the GBC has spent a tremendous amount of time dealing with this particular issue. We're aware of all these quotes. You know, it's not the first time I heard the Dhruva Maharaj quote and other quotes like that, but and it's a question of balancing things, not adjusting things to meet the modern world. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand how to apply Prabhupada's instructions to carry out Prabhupada's missions and not break the essential aspects, or any aspect, of Prabhupada's intention, instructions of the Vedic culture. You know, we, we got, uh, I mean, all these things have been dealt with. We have the Shastric Advisory Committee, the GBC, and we've been straining our minds over this. It's not an easy, it's not an easy issue. I mean, personally, I would prefer that if every lady was married in a nice situation and nice husband and protector, 
That would be the best thing. But we're dealing with the real world. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, I agree fully with this. But what, what we see, and I can see in Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, this countries, and also part of this Western civilization. This what Shiva Prabhupada said that woman should not be fully independent is very important. I really. Well, I agree 100%. I, I'm, not, I'm not agitated, but I'm concerned about something that I see. I, we can see that if woman is fully independent and not situated properly, not only with the husband, but situated properly, they have proper uh, attitude, it can create chaos in the society. And we can see, my question is, why is so many divorces also in ISCOM? This is my question. If this Western society, who is very pressure of this Western society, who is very strong on everyone, also on the devotees and on our society, why we need, why we need, we need so much interpretation of very clear Shiva Prabhupada statements who are very deep? It's not yeah. so easy to follow, I agree with this. Yeah. But step by step, we should appreciate very much a deep, uh, deep, deep deepness. That if step by step we will we can follow them. And we can see then that women, if they work on this attitude, what is going on on Shastras in Shiva Prabhupada's books, and men also have uh, take responsibility. Because we see that today in our society our society today, uh, Western and also in Eastern, women become more like men and Men become more like women, more weaker, weaker, weaker. Well, I, I'm in agree with you about this. This is very big problem because of the divorces and the mixing with each other. I, I, in Belgrade, our temple, <coughs> big temple, was destroyed because of that mixing husbands and wives together with each other, and this comes from Western society. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm not in disagree with you. I mean, I agree 100. percent I would like all marriages to stay together. I mean. But, you know, if the husband leaves, you know, sometimes it's the woman's fault, sometimes it's the man's fault. I mean, this has been my experience. Sometimes it's the mother-in-law's fault. I had one marriage in Balkan here. There was, anyway, I'm not going to get into it because they may be watching. But anyways, <laughs> you know, there's details. So, so, yes, 100%. You know, if we had the ideal Vedic society, fantastic. But right now, there's ladies who are not married, and they need to take shelter of the society somehow or other. It, it, you know, a Krishna conscious society, and Prabhupada mentioned that. If, if the best scenario is not there, you can't just say, well, then nothing. You know, so there has to be, there has to be some arrangement. And if, Prabhupada said if a woman's husband leaves him, leaves her. This is not too modern. Anyway, so if the woman's husband leaves, he told the woman not to get married. You know, so what do you do in that case? So, you know, in the, in the real world, we have to sometimes make adjustments in line with Srila Prabhupada's instructions. And I'm not talking about Diksha Gurus right now. I'm just talking about the protection of women. I 100% agree with it. The women need to be protected because the men are unscrupulous. The men exploit the women. And Prabhupada said, you know, just further in the line of what you were talking about, that it was actually men who were behind the women's liberation movement. Did you know that? He said it was men behind it, and Prabhupada gave the example. When milk is available freely in the marketplace, who will go to the trouble of keeping a cow? That means men can exploit women without taking responsibility, then they'll do it. So Prabhupada said it was actually the men who were responsible for the women's liberation movement. Yes, but men become weak today. Yes, so men, yeah, so I, I understand. Women because it's uh, created such atmosphere that women can become more strong, strong, strong. Men, and men, if man is weak, he cannot protect women properly. 
This is a that, very that, serious, serious problem. That's a serious uh, problem. So you should present solutions to this problem. But at, at the present time, you know, we have whatever we have in this situation. We're trying to make the best in terms of Prabhupada's intention and instructions. And I'm not, this is not a Diksha Guru issue. This is simply the issue of protecting <coughs> ladies, which I 100%. 100%, 110% agree with. You know, you're not going to find that disappearing. I'm, but as far as opportunities for serving Krishna, I 100% think that women should have the same opportunities to do deity worship. You may not think so. Some of these is very delicate thing, in my opinion. No, because, because Krishna gave us not the same nature. If uh, Shiva Prabhupada said this equal rights is very artificial. We're not, we're not talking about equal rights, we're talking about opportunities uh, for service. Spiritually we are equal, but inside of physical nature we are not equal. I agree, I agree, but there's opportunities for service. Yes. You know, people should be given opportunities for service. And people have different natures. If someone has the nature to manage, and they happen to be in a woman's body, and they should be protected, then they should have the opportunity to manage. I'm not talking about becoming the world of Charya or anything like that. You know, people should have the opportunity to utilize their talents in Krishna's service. And we can't deny that. I mean, in general, we can generalize things, but individually, like a man, for example, may want to become, I don't want to say a seamstress, someone who sews a lot. That's not a man's occupation generally, but he may have that, in, that uh, tendency or that desire. Why not give him that opportunity to do that? So it's, it's a question of giving people opportunities to do what they want to do for Krishna on, in this Vedic system where Ladies can be protected. Okay. I think we have to take prasadam now, so. You know, it's a, it's a discussion that can go on forever, and we've had this discussion on the GBC for years ad infinitum. And uh, we can have it for another 10 years, too. <laughs> but, you know, people... We do want to follow Prabhupada and whatever Prabhupada said. I'm completely devoted to Prabhupada, dedicated to his instructions, his uh, instructions on spirituality, his instructions on social organization too. Okay.